difficulties, but we've overcome them now. I'm Annalisa Steffen, editor of the Getty Voices Project, which presents first-person perspectives and weekly rotation here at the Getty. This week's topic is Rethinking Art History. And we're held, holding this topic in conjunction with a digital art history lab that will convene at the Getty Research Institute this week. With me are three colleagues from the Getty. We have two uh, at one computer. <laughs> we have two art historians with one pair of headphones. Um, Anne Helmreich is a senior program officer in the Getty Foundation and an art historian. Martha Baca is head of digital art history access at the Getty Research Institute and an art historian as well. And we also have with us Susan Edwards, an art historian and a technologist in the Getty's web group. This is our first Google Plus Hangout on air, so I'll ask you to bear with us if we um, have any awkward technical moments. Um, let's get started with a question for you, Martha, because you are chairing this week's Digital Art History Lab. Um, our topic for this Hangout is resuscitating art history. So why does art history need to be resuscitated? I want to start out by saying that Anne and I often say we're partners in crime, but this is getting <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> being attached to one headphone. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I, I work in the Getty Research Institute and Anne in a past incarnation was a scholar there and we attend these very abstruse uh, lectures by the various uh, residential scholars for which the audience is the people in the room and the people that can understand the presentations might be five or ten other scholars throughout the world. So I think that art history also because of its um, apparent hesitation at embracing di digital technology really uh, risks being left behind and becoming kind of a marginalized or obsolete. It's also being dropped in a lot of academic programs. Mm. Um, Anne, do you want to continue with your answer to that question? Yes, um, I mean this is something that Martha <clears throat> and I have talked about a lot in terms of the digital realm. If you look at a lot of the other humanities disciplines like history, literature, media studies, they're much more active in the framework of what's called the digital ham humanities than art history has traditionally been. And it feels like it's at a turning point because technology is changing so fast. Um, and the visual is so vital to the way we think of work in our culture today that art historians really have something unique and significant to contribute to how we might think about images and the way we talk um, about images in the digital age. Okay, um, so this week, as I mentioned, we're doing a small uh, digital art history lab that you're convening, Martha. Um, uh, what exactly is digital art history? Let's break that down. Um, what does that mean and can you give some specific examples of what that means today? Well, this is another thing that Anne and I have talked about ad nauseum because there are a lot of, a lot. There is no one definition I think of digital art history. But my direct, the director of my institute, Dr. Thomas Gitkin, says that digital art history is not just a database. So the Getty has a long tradition of producing research databases like the Bibliography of the History of Art, the Getty Vocabularies. Uh, we recently, last year, launched the Getty Research Portal, which offers uh, access to uh, digitize rare books, but that is not art history, it's just access to art historical resources. So I guess I would say just off the top of my head, art his digital art history is using digital technology to both conduct and produce and publish new knowledge in the realm of art history. Anne, what do you think? I, I agree entirely. <clears throat> and what's really interesting, if you think about art history as a discipline, We've relied heavily on new technologies. I mean, the, the introduction of the photograph at the end of the 19th century, um, you know, as a way to, you know, be, when it becomes mass produced, really changed the discipline. The introduction of color um, for color illustrations changed the discipline. So I think, again, we're a discipline that actually has a history of being open to change. But as Martha says, it's not just enough to be using PowerPoint or accessing online databases. It's really taking that next step and asking how the digital technology might make available new ways of knowledge formation, whether in dialogue with students or in dialogue with the peers, um, and ways in which we can think about um, changing the discipline and not just how it's published and disseminated through the online environment, but the very questions we can ask. 
Um, Susan, just to turn to you, so you're a technologist and an art historian and you've been looking at web projects specifically in the digital humanities for some years, um, including fields such as history and literary studies. Can you give us some examples of how practitioners in these allied fields are using technology and what art historians might learn from that? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that Mirtha and Anna have been saying. I think part of the, pro the challenge that our history faces is getting um, that data to be computer readable. Uh, so art history is sort of as, at a disadvantage to some of the more text-based fields because computers speak in text. Text is sort of the native language, or I should say characters is the native language of computers. Um, and so for, you know, for decades, for almost a century now, computers have been very facile at um, using lots of, of text-based data and analyzing that data. And the literature studies field actually was really early to adopt this by digitizing text and making it really easy to, to analyze vast quantities of data. And it really transformed the literature field. So, you know, in the past, a scholar who would have to spend his entire career learning all of the classical texts, for example, in order to analyze them and create meaningful um, analyses of the text, now, through something like the Perseus Digital Library, which is an online compendium of all, a lot of classical tests, within hours you could do the research today that it would take a scholar 40 years ago to do his whole career. Um, so I think that our historical field is, is, is sort of a little, we're behind because we haven't been sort of thinking about how visual um, tools can be used online and how we can and analyze tools visually, but also we just haven't created the data in the first place. So Mirtha pointed, she mentioned the vocabularies and a lot of the um, thesaurus databases that the Getty has created, but a lot of libraries and archives and museums now are really behind on just digitizing their images. So until we have, we do the hard work to sort of get all of the works of art, the archives the, and all the related material that art historians need digitized, it's gonna be really hard to even start doing all this really great analytic work. If I can just jump in, I think there's some um, good building blocks that are already out there. Um, I just left a lecture on William Blake, which reminded me of the work that's been yeah. done at the University of Virginia, the Blake Project or the Rossetti Project, where these are two artists in particular that worked closely with text and image together. Yeah. And um, these projects have done a great job of exactly what Susan was describing, making available images and text. And I feel like it's now we need to see what we can build on top of mm -hmm. those. What can I ask and um, what new ways might I think about Blake or Rossetti that I couldn't really right. easily do before um, when I might have, you know, 15 volumes scattered across my desk or couldn't think about how an image changed over time. Both of these are artists that went back and reworked images, for example. So I think we have some good building blocks out there in our community and the challenge for us is what can we do with those building blocks? Right. How can we really take advantage of the work or the work that the vocabularies has done or the Getty and putting mm -hmm. its collections online. So I think as a community, we need to push ourselves and ask those um, new kinds of questions. Right. I should say too, though, apropos of text, actually both Anne and I work with text on our projects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anne, Anne uses big data from, uh, from archival documents and sales catalogs, and I'm, I'm, my project, my current project is analyzing text from a historical document. And one of the problems too is that that kind of data is so inconsistent mm -hmm. and idiosyncratic that it has to be scrubbed and standardized before the computer can do anything to it. So these are just some of the challenges that we're going to be talking about in this workshop this week. Okay, just one last question. Um, I wanted to bring in um, one statement from um, some of our social media followers who very kindly engaged with this upcoming topic. Um, Amy on Tumblr talks about the codified manner in which young art historians get published, advance in their career, and ways in which they're validated, welcomed, and accepted into, art, into the art historical community. Um, I wonder if you could comment on um, how that's changing and whether more could be done in, the, in that area to welcome emerging digital art historians. Well, it's changing a little bit slowly. Mm -hmm. It is changing, but it's, and I talk about this in the blog post that we, uh, that we published this morning, is that up to now, really, traditionally in academic departments in, in universities or in research centers, you have to have print, public, a young scholar has to have print publications to continue their career. And if they do an pro online project, it doesn't really add to their professional mm -hmm. profile. Something that the Getty can do, and my institute in particular, and also Anne's uh, section of the Getty, is to start saying these these digital projects, which, which result in online publications, are just as valid as a print publication. 
and they should further a, a, a scholar's career no matter what point of their career they're at. And in fact, if we look at other professional organizations like the um, MLA for English Literature or the Historians Association, those um, organizations have already published guidelines for evaluating digital, or they're in the process of establishing guidelines for um, evaluating digital scholarship. And this is also something Johanna Drucker, who will be participating in the workshop, has done in the recent collection she co-authored with colleagues. So I think in the end, it's peer review that matters. And it's just building, for our historians, we'll be building up a community of peers who can evaluate one another's scholarship. Um, and this is what, again, English literature and history have begun to do and provide guidelines. And our professional organization is beginning to look at this question. But I think there's good models for us out there from these other disciplines. Okay, great. All right, thank you so very much. We're going to um, not say goodbye to this conversation, but merely pause it because the Digital Art History Lab begins tomorrow and will continue on the IRIS, the Getty IRIS uh, online magazine, as well as Facebook and Twitter. So if any of those watching and participating here have questions or topics you'd like to see explored further, we would love to hear about them. So please leave a comment. And uh, reposts are welcome. Uh, so uh, goodbye for now. Um, thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Mirtha. Thanks, Anne. And thanks, Susan. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay.